CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach that takes on each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills to provide creative solutions for their clients. Based right here in Western New York, CTBK is a champion for your business and our community. Additionally, CTBK goes beyond tax and attest services by offering a wide array of consulting and outsourced solutions tailored to meet the unique needs of your business, allowing you to focus on your operational and long-term strategic goals. Whether you're a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, the team at CTBK is determined to help you succeed. Visit ctbk.com or call 716-630-2400, 716-630-2400 to learn how CTBK's one-team approach can work for you. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with my co-host, Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. And uh, years ago, uh, I had the honor, as a lot of sports writers over history have done, to be able to give somebody a nickname that sticks. It's kind of a cool thing that happens in sports, and I guess maybe in political writing, you know, whether you come up with some sort of uh, slick nickname. Uh, but uh, back in the early aughts, in a story for, I'm not sure what magazine I was freelancing for, one of the national magazines, uh, probably KO or, um, I don't know if Joe Macy was in The Ring yet, because The Ring was considered a very prestigious, you know, for the best of the best. And they didn't do a lot of stuff on prospects uh, at the ring. That was more of a KO uh, realm. But I referred to Joe Macy as the third franchise. And the very next fight, he came into the ring with the third franchise emblazoned on his trunks. And I thought, oh, nice. I came up with one that stuck. And um, we have an interesting summer. Uh, that's been going on, or I should say spring, I, I, we can call them the warm season, in which uh, we are watching the Buffalo Bandits in a do or die situation Saturday night against the Colorado Mammoth for the National Lacrosse League title. Um, we have the Amherst doing well. Uh, we have Jesse Pagula in the French Open. And I'm just curious, uh, what is Buffalo's third franchise these days? Does Joe Macy hold on to that uh, moniker for perpetuity? Uh, or does he have to give it up? Who, who, what's the third franchise right now in Buffalo sports? Well, right now, I would say it's the Bandits. And I think historically you can make an argument for the Bandits. But it is a bit of a nuanced discussion where obviously the Bills are the first franchise the oldest franchise that still exists and the most important. And then the Sabres and, and the Buffalo Braves at one point in time were the third professional franchise. But over time, I think it's morphed and changed. And Joe Macy definitely did reach a level of uh, that third franchise moniker that you came up with. And, and not just that it, the way it's stuck among fans and people going to the, the fights down at the arena and over at UB, it did actually feel like uh, another major sporting event occurring in Buffalo involving a, a Buffalonian. And I think if you're talking about individuals, it has to kind of have that element um, of taking over, capturing the attention of the, the audience, the way Joe Macy's career briefly <laughs> did. But the bandits, even at that time had been uh, a franchise around for 10 years that had already won three championships and been to the finals a number of times beyond that. And now they're going for what would be their fifth championship. If they're able to win this, this Saturday night at home, um, we'll be broadcast on local television on the CW network channel 23. And this is their 12th time playing in the final, but is the third in a row and fourth and sixth years in which the bandits haven't won. So while establishing themselves as a potential third franchise and drawing 13, 14, 15,000 people to the arena and having games that are in a major league and last week's games were on ESPN too, but locally, um, if the bandits aren't able to finish the job this week, it is sort of trending into fulfilling that Buffalo sports legacy of not being able to win the big one, even though this franchise has done that in its past, but over the last 15 years and its last now four trips to the finals, 
it is starting to have shades of those 90s bills of not being able to finish the job. I think, too, you could uh, probably agree with me that before Joe Macy, uh, before the Buffalo Bandits became uh, a phenomenon uh, back in the, the late 90s, early 2000s, the Buffalo Bisons would be the third franchise when Absolutely. Mike Bellani was running the team and they were generating uh, gates of a million people a year in their brand new ballpark that then became the model for Camden Yards and Jacobs Field and all those retro parks that came after. And it was a cool thing to do. Um, I, and I bring the Bisons up uh, because uh, the NLL championship game is going to take place the same night as uh, Star Wars night uh, downtown, which will create uh, probably some interesting uh, parking problems uh, down there. And uh, an ECMC uh, annual event uh, is going to be at the convention center too, from what I understand. I'm not familiar with the event, but from what I'm told, it's pretty big. Um, so that'll be uh, remarkable. But um, the Bison's, Pretty irrelevant, I think. And um, of course, you grew up in Western New York. I'm not from here. I'm from Cleveland. Uh, but I understand how Buffalo was very close to becoming uh, a major league team, or at least they campaigned for it and believed that they came close uh, back when um, uh, the rich family was really pushing for major league baseball uh, expansion here. And it didn't work out. And the residual was kind of a, a not a triple a team really, but almost like a four a team because of the new ballpark. And um, the fact that the riches uh, ran the uh, operation uh, closer to a major league uh, type atmosphere or quality uh, than what you'd get at what in the 1990s would be typical minor league baseball. And, um, but the Bisons have really fallen, fallen off in the discussion. Um, I don't hear people talk about the Bisons out and around town. I don't hear about it at the bar. I don't hear anybody talking about this player, that player. It, back when I moved to Buffalo in the early 2000s, you would uh, you would hear quite a bit about the guys who were coming through, uh, whether it be for the Indians or uh, you know somebody being down, Manny Ramirez on a rehab assignment or coming down for the Blue Jays or the Mets and all the different iterations that have happened over the years. But who are the Jeff Mantos anymore? I mean, you just don't, it just doesn't seem to connect in Buffalo the way it used to. And that's why star Wars night is such a big deal. And I'm sure that the folks at the Bisons are not happy that the bandits are stealing their thunder, which I think is, a, is symbolic in and of itself. When you're talking about who's the third franchise or what Buffalo's, uh, sports offerings uh, that go beyond uh, Bills, Sabres, and the big four colleges, even if you want to include them in the conversation. Yeah, I mean, just to circle back on the Bisons, it hasn't been that long since players like Vladimir Guerrero and Bo Bichette and Kelvin Biggio were playing on the Bison. So it goes in waves. In yeah, that's true. That's true. Having some relevance. And then it, even though it wasn't Bisons baseball, the fact that the Blue Jays played major league games for parts of two summers in Buffalo, which was connected to being the affiliate and the Bison's existence and the stadium and the history of how they built that. That to me, though, was a thought that. that wasn't if you if the fans couldn't really experience it, especially the first season. And I know that they eventually were able to, but it's moved. On. I don't think any it was good for it was a blip. Yeah, but I think it I think it did support that uh, 4A argument for Buffalo baseball. It yeah. is. It is the biggest AAA stadium. But they don't hold on to it. Like you say, it comes in waves. No. It comes in waves. They can't. It, so I guess it's, they can a, occasionally poke their head up and be the third franchise uh, for a bit here or there, maybe for a week, maybe for a month. And in the case of a total fluke, uh, the Blue Jays uh, playing their home games uh, in Buffalo, then baseball can can matter for a, for a full summer. But – um, there's also the historical, there's been iterations of the Buffalo Bisons that go back centuries. And I think was even a major league team in the very early days of major league baseball. So there is, I think maybe an academic argument that 
the Buffalo Bisons, the name being used in other sports for hockey, as well as I think football, that there is in Buffalo's sporting history, depending on how far back you want to pull out and focus, that the Buffalo Bisons kind of ranks up there with the Bills and the Sabres as historically the third most prominent franchise. But as you mentioned, it seems to have fallen. I think what, what maybe hurts the Bisons in this discussion and absolutely belong in the discussion, but is if you are old enough to remember what it was like from 88 to 92 and comparing what Bison's baseball looks and feels like now to what it was when we thought we were kind of in the early stages of having Major League Baseball in this city. It's just not the same buzz and not the same feeling. And I think it's a cop out to say college sports in general would be the third franchise. I guess you could break it down by college. I think that would be allowable. So maybe UB is the third franchise, but even then, eh, and of course, I think that would be the obvious pick uh, when the basketball team uh, was going to the NCAA tournament, but that clunked uh, pretty quickly. Um, All it took was a coaching change and obviously a big drop off from Nate Oates to Jim Weitzel. Um, But Anybody who thought that UB had it figured out when it came to basketball success uh, or recruiting or making that arena work or whatever it is, um, obviously uh, you would be disappointed. Uh, You would, uh, had you made that prediction or if you felt comfortable uh, that UB basketball uh, had uh, figured out the secret sauce uh, that was required uh, to be atop the Mac on a regular basis. Um, What about Jesse Pagula? I mean, she is uh, still climbing. I I know that she's um, there's does her ranking is high. I think she, what is she? Six, but number three in the world, she's number three, number three in the world. Um, But uh, she plays in a lot of tournaments, which helps in that regard. It does seem though, that when she goes up against the best of the best, there's a, there's a noticeable uh, gap uh, between her and the the true elites, but that's not to say that she can't get there. But hell, she's uh, I would say that she's had a more successful career in tennis than Joe Macy had in boxing, and he's somebody who got to be number one in the world in the heavyweight rankings, the most prominent division, undefeated. Uh, probably would have won a championship if not for. Uh, the brain bleed that kept him uh, out of the ring in both Nevada and New York, uh, which made him a less marketable uh, uh, commodity. Uh, It delayed his career, all kinds of things um, that shelved him. Um, He would have won one of the, I always roll my eyes, even as somebody who covered boxing at the time, one of the four accepted world championships Um, at the time, I'm sure that, uh, Macy's camp could have just picked a certain opponent. They were a big WBC, um, camp. They liked, uh, the, the, that's where he was ranked number one, but I'm sure that they could have plotted, uh, uh, some sort of uh, match with the IBF, the WBA or the WBO champion, whoever they felt they could beat the easiest and, uh, won the championship that way. But I think that even head to head, I think Jesse Pagula might have Joe Macy. I mean, sure, Jesse Pagula might have already, or in the end, finished with a more accomplished tennis career than Joe Macy had in boxing. The but interesting think- thing about that, Jonah, and I know she was born in Buffalo and the whole thing, but she was raised in Florida, and she, you know, she grew well, up. There. However, she is prob she is probably going to be the owner of the Bills and the Sabers someday. Perhaps. I mean, I just, I, mean, I don't know yeah. if you watched HBO Succession. I mean, there are some different sure. things that may happen, but you know, Matt uh, Pagula also has interest, and maybe an in-law gets it or whatever. But she has the acumen with her athletic background and her husband, who is uh, prominent within the family business, uh, that uh, that we could see uh, Jesse Pagula uh, and oh. her husband as the as the co-owners of the the two franchises in town. I mean, Mary Wilson played tennis too. I don't know if you can really kind of tie those two things together. I think Jesse Pagula. Mary Wilson wasn't in majors. She wasn't playing at Roland Garros. Sure. But what I mean is, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know think if maybe she did. Uh, a person whose parents own the bills and might potentially own the bills and the Sabres. 
puts you in the same category as being from West New York, although she is from West New York. So I'm not trying to say that. Um, I feel like is she's not more a native West New Yorker. At, when when um, when everybody first started claiming her as a Western New York native, it seemed not quite correct. It, it just feels uh, much too like loose. much like Greg Oden was from Buffalo or Oral Hershiser was from Buffalo. They just passed through at a very young age. They just happened to be born here. Well, um, whereas she bit. has reestablished her uh, bona fides in terms of Buffalo and the things that she does, the comments that she makes in her news conference, she's sipping a, a Labatt, uh, you know, what all these other little things. And she's present. She's here at the Bills games. And uh, I, anyways. I think she's reestablished her her Buffalo credentials. Yeah, I, I mean, I, some of it's the nature of the sport of tennis at the junior level where the elite players go away to play or living in Florida and training in Florida and competing in Florida is where future tennis pros reside, even if they're from elsewhere. But this isn't the case as it might be with a football or basketball player where when a local makes it to the highest level, a lot of people remember seeing that person in the youth leagues or playing for local high schools or representing local teams and local youth organizations or Patrick Kane used to skate around at Casanova Park and things like that. You don't kind of get that local folklore from Jessica Pagula in the same way. And I do wonder right. if the Pagulas had never bought the Bills, if there would be that same local connection and the strength of feeling like she was playing on behalf of Western New York without that business tie. And I think the other thing, no fault of Jessica Pagula, but there is no means for the WTA or a major tennis tournament to come to Buffalo and have her have these um, athletic events on home territory in the way that the bandits and Joe Macy was able to You're do right. I think that. All right. I'm all right. I'm, I'm going to stand down on that. No, she has not come because of those things. You're right. I think that she has not matched Joe Macy and probably never will. But it, maybe, um, I wouldn't say never. Will, Joe Macy I, was able to bring events here. HBO yeah. televised bouts from HSBC Arena. Uh, ESPN's Friday Night Fights televised a fight from Alumni Arena on the UB campus. Uh, they, it was it was a pretty cool thing that uh, that happened here. Uh, it was uh, for a few years. Joe okay. Macy was a big deal. Town of Tonawanda, you know, he was sweet home high grad. It wasn't just uh, you know he went off to some. Uh, you know, some school and strapped on headgear and, and learned how to box out in Vegas like Ross Thompson did. Ross Thompson, a, a, a Buffalo native who was ranked number one in the world as a middleweight or a junior middleweight. I'm pretty sure it was middleweight. Um, waited his turn to fight and finally got a chance to fight for the title against uh, Fernando Vargas and didn't do too well. But that was Ross Thompson. He was so good at boxing that he was sent off to Richard Steele, the famed referee, to Richard Steele's... Um, school i guess and he lived he worked or the gym he had a gym but it was he had a like a, a group of fighters that he that he dealt with it wasn't just like you belonged to a gym it was more like a training facility and uh, he lived in vegas to be a boxer uh joe macy didn't do that he did everything in western new york uh what's the what's the um what's the what's the gym he used to it's um in the city um, it wasn't a boys and girls club, but it was something like that. I mean, it was an old dingy place with a heavy bag. And I mean, it wasn't, there was no glamor with Joe Macy. Uh, he, but he made it a point to, uh, to, to fight out of Western New York, which is pretty cool. And there have been other professional tennis players of, to some acclaim, Jimmy Arias being one of them that comes to mind who have played a high level of tennis and then came back to Western New York to, be local club pros, to give lessons, play in the Muni Leagues at later ages and things like that. And if Jesse Pagula ends up becoming more ingrained in Buffalo, perhaps as a higher ranking executive in PSC, that that could maybe strengthen that cause. And I don't think Jesse Pagula is sitting there at home thinking, I got to be the third franchise of Buffalo and what can right. I do? And I wouldn't even rule out the possibility just from an event planning standpoint of someday there being a tennis exhibition or a tennis invitational event in a local venue. If Jesse Pagula were to win a grand slam, and that could be a bit of a Buffalo area curtain call to promote something like that. 
I think that would be a kind of a cool event. I don't know if we have the proper venue for that. I think that's another reason why you don't see local tenants in this area because we don't have the tennis specific stadium and the new stadium isn't being built in such a way. I don't think where something like that would be properly hosted there, but it could happen. But one more point I want to make on behalf of the bandits. I do think the answer to this is the bandits because of it's a franchise that's been around now for 30 plus years and they've had success. They've won championships. They've drawn well in the arena. They play in the biggest indoor venue in town. They played in the odd. Now they play in the first or the key bank center. So it's not a minor league facility or league and also that you know the sport of the cross is indigenous to this area um, with some of the with the Seneca Nation territory and it spreads a bit across here in southern Ontario and into the Finger Lakes but you can draw a line from the sport being invented in and around western New York to today when it is the highest drawing city in the National Lacrosse League and there's an atmosphere and an energy in the arena for these bandits games that the rest of the league tries to emulate and that they're not only a successful franchise that have won championships, but really one of the marquee franchises in indoor lacrosse. And I think that's not only have the bandits been around a long time and won championships, but they've really risen to be, you know, a prominent professional sports franchise and a prominent professional league that can make Buffalo proud. And I think that helps make the case for the bandits here. And it's worked. Like you say, you mentioned the uh, the length of time uh, that the Bandits have been here in Buffalo. And uh, practically every minor league operation has come through at one point, whether it's the Arena Football League or indoor soccer. And, you know, this this area has has gone through pretty much anything that you can have. And uh, almost all of it doesn't last, uh, with the exception of the Bisons and the Bandits. And uh, so, yeah, that's a Saturday night against the Colorado Mammoth. It's a do-or-die game uh, in the uh, best-of-three series. And you had already mentioned the, the statistics. They haven't won in, uh, since 2008. They keep getting uh, bites at the apple, uh, but uh, haven't been able to close the deal for 15 years. Or 14, this would be 15 years. So, um, yeah, it's... Uh, do you, your thoughts on on the game, Jonah? I know you're writing about it for WIVB.com. Yeah, well, it's an interesting matchup. It's a rematch of last year's finals, which Colorado won in the same case this year as last year. Buffalo Bandits come in with the number one seed, have home floor advantage in the best of three series, win game one, seem to be in a good position to win the championship, and then last year they lose game two on the road and game three at home. Now they come into this year, they win game one again, and then lose game two in Denver. And coming back, it's either a deja vu repeat scenario or, you know, redemption. And they get over the hump and win that first championship in 15 years, which maybe doesn't seem like a long time to Sabres or Bills fans. But in the history of the Bandits, you know, they won four championships in the first 15 or 16 seasons. Now it's been another decade and a half trying to get that fifth one. And the key, a a big key is the health of leading goal scorer and second leader in points, Josh Byrne, who missed the first two games with an upper body injury. And I guess at this point would be considered questionable. We'll see kind of how that develops into the practice on Friday night and the game on Saturday. I don't know if they've missed him offensively, but he's one of the best players. And the way the lineup has to form with him out, not in the lineup, their defense and their transition and the number of penalties that they took in the game two loss maybe seem to have been affected by not having one of their best attack players and having to adjust for that loss. So having him back, it makes the offense better. And I think in a way it will make the defense and the overall game better. And just in the sense that if you're going to win a championship uh, at the highest level, you probably need all of your high level players. Um, Let me ask uh, regarding the third franchise discussion as we move away. I mean, we'll transition there, but I want to ask you this uh, because I think you posed this question before we hit the record button. Uh, What is the third most prominent beat if for a sports reporter in Western New York, Bills and the Sabres are obviously number one and two, respectively. Um, what's number three? Well, it's a similar discussion to the third franchise, but I think there's different nuances to it. And I mean, I don't know if there is a definite answer. And you, you have more experience in the Buffalo newsroom than maybe 
delineate that, but I think it's also the Buffalo the news time. doesn't even cover the bandits. Correct. And, or, or the bisons really on a day-to-day basis. Right. So I don't, I don't know if you're coming into this market and you obviously know that the bills are the number one beat. And it's pretty obvious that the Sabres are the number two beat. It's really not obvious what the third most important beat would be. And I think there's a lot of people who have either worked at the news or in and around even news readers that might say it's the high school coverage overall, or maybe it is the college coverage. All of these things have seen less coverage over the years. Uh, UB football, I think, is maybe from a media perspective standpoint, gets the the third most attention. And at various times, there's been that could be a full time beat for maybe at least half the year. Whereas covering local college basketball, you usually spread between all of the teams and men's and women's, and even a little bit of the Division Two, II, Division Three type teams. Um, you know, it's also it's not just a hierarchy of a beat writer and what job it's if you're slotting the front page of a paper, uh, you know, the bills get the top story, the Sabres get the second story down the rail. What's, what's your third most important front page story. If you're putting together a website and you got categories, okay, bills, number one, Sabres, number two, what's number three. And I don't know. I think you can make colleges, but I think that's, I already stated, I think that's a cop out just to say all the colleges are the third franchise. You can't do that. So you had colleges, even more important than high schools where you're covering all local people with local relatives and local schools and local alumni and local ties. Cause sometimes I think the college coverage loses relevance if there's not enough local connection on the teams and the coaching staffs. So the third franchise, I guess, is uh, something I don't know that it's going to make it into my obituary, uh, but it's a bit of trivia about my career that uh, makes, uh, gives me a smile. Uh, because it's a cool thing that sports writers and political writers and journalists in general have the um, opportunity to do. Sometimes they try to they come up with nicknames. They try to come up with uh, uh, just a, a way to characterize somebody, and the audience will then absorb it and take it in and and repeat it. And that's what you get with most sports nicknames. That's probably you know, what's where Mean Joe Green and Broadway Joe Namath come from. That's where Babe Ruth comes from. Um, I think. I think that was a sports writer thing, especially back in the old days. They were that was the big ones. But anyways, um, I want to bring up a couple of other nicknames because it's a segue into a story that I've been working on since our last podcast. We were talking about the NHL's. Uh, championship round, which is going to begin this weekend. And either Sam Reinhart or Jack Eichel will win the Stanley Cup. And we, I pondered whether Jack Eichel is the most polarizing player in Sabres history. And while I was saying it, um, I'm calculating that I don't know the answer to that. And I had it in my head, okay, well, I'm going to do a story on it. Once, you know, if I had the time to do it this week and I have, so I've put together a list uh, of the 12 most polarizing sabers. It is going to run at the athletic tomorrow. And uh, the reason I have the nicknames is because Jerry Sullivan came up with Tin Man Turgeon, uh, either Jerry or Bucky Gleason came up with Tiny Tim Connolly. Uh, and these are nicknames that stuck. I wonder where the Dominator came from. I know that that is an easy nickname to come up with, obviously, because Dominic Hasek, Dominator, of course. But I wonder who the first person was to come up with that. Um, I don't know if it was Jim Kelly or if it was Bob DeCesare or maybe it was Bud Bailey or maybe the Sabres came up with it. Maybe it was a team-driven nickname. I don't know. But I I wonder where that nickname originated. Um. But that's a cool one to have. Uh, to, if you could take credit for the Dominator, that's a pretty good one. Um, anyway, any guesses? Uh, I, I don't want to give it away, but any guesses or who might be on the most polarizing um, uh, Sabres list in franchise history? All right, let me let me tell you this before you guess. By polarizing, that means that you have to have been both loved and hated. You had fans or media who were picking sides, as was the case, obviously, with Jack Eichel, where people argued whether the talent was worth the headache or whether the talent didn't live up to the billing 
or maybe the player was beloved as a community figure, but just didn't have the uh, acumen to go along with it or the skill set. Um, disappointing for the time, maybe prolific in statistics, but not good enough to lead and, and bring a championship. So there's all kinds of ways you can be polarizing, but I think the key to it is you can't just be, you can't, it's not just you're a, a villain. That's not, you can't be Villy Leno. You're, you can't just be, you have to have a balance to it. Who comes to mind? I mean, I think, I think Thomas Vanek fits the bill. I think that's someone who's probably on your list because, you know, he was the team's best offensive player at, at points in his career, leading scorer and a talented and popular player. But I don't know if his popularity always measured quite up to his production. And then there was the whole thing about when Edmonton made him the offer sheet when he was a restricted free agent, whether the Sabres should have matched that or taken the picks. Right. That comes right after the Drury Briere situation. I think there was a lot of polarization in the fan base as to whether – Vanek was worth matching that contract and not taking the picks or if the Sabres should have. Let me get my, my preliminary list. Um, um, I don't know if this is somebody that's going to make your list, but I think there was a polarizing element of Ted Nolan as the coach through his two different tenures. Absolutely. Really Absolutely. Popular. And I was actually going to get into picking a coach and a general manager for the all, all polarizing team. And that would have been, I think, I think it would have been Ted Nolan and Darcy Regeer I would have settled on, although a Ted Nolan, John Muckler reunion would have been spicy uh, in my, in my uh, make-believe team here. I was actually going to maybe even put together four lines and three defensive pairs that got a little unwieldy, um, but names that you may or may not see. And if you do see them on the list, where would they rank? How about, I'm going to throw in some, uh, this is my preliminary list. The, the list has been finalized, 1 through 12. Uh, it's all set and ready to go tomorrow. But I'm going to throw in a couple of red herrings. This is from my list as I was spitballing with uh, some experts. I, I can name them, I think. I talked to Bud Bailey for it, the former Sabres PR man and uh, beat writer for the Buffalo News. John Vogel, uh, who was a uh, beat writer for The Athletic and The Buffalo News and is now an editor at, at The Athletic. Um, Kevin Snow, formerly of Sabres PR and uh, writer for Sabres.com. Um, Bucky Gleason, Buffalo News Sports columnist. Um, Rick Jenneret, uh, Chris Parker. And I'm missing somebody. So all white men so far. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, and one of my favorite parts, though, going back and researching the column that Hockey Hall of Fame writer Jim Kelly wrote the day the person was either traded or left, because that is the perspective that you get in the moment of how polarizing that player was. So I have quotes from Jim Kelly's columns uh, as these players were on, on their way out the door in which he tries to sum up these people as no one else can really. I mean, who, who else could No, I couldn't, I covered the team for a bit. None of the current, anybody, I just maybe Bud Bailey because he was there uh, a little bit more, uh, some names, uh, Robin Leonard, Evander Kane, Pierre Turgeon, Miroslav Shatan, um, Maxima Finneganov is a name worth considering Matthew Barnaby, um, Dimitri Kalinin. Again, not all these are on it. So just giving you some. Tim Connolly, Alexander Mogilny, um, Derek Roy. Did I say Dimitri Kalinin? Um, Alexei Zhitnik, Phil Housley, Doug Gilmore, who had a weird tenure. Anyways, there's just some names that are thrown around there. There's a list of 12. I rank them. Something to look for uh, Friday at The Athletic. Um, something that you could see today, right now at The Athletic, or whenever you're listening to this, because it posted before we hit the record button. Uh, I spoke with three NFL executives uh, who have some information regarding DeAndre Hopkins' expectations in the market. And uh doesn't look good. 
for the Buffalo Bills. In fact, uh, one of the sources who has uh, uh, great knowledge uh, on the matter says uh, it's a long shot that uh, DeAndre Hopkins joins the Bills. And there are a few reasons for this, of course, and we've been talking about him uh, for a few weeks now on the podcast. Um, Number one, as much as DeAndre Hopkins has said on his social media accounts that he wants to play with Josh Allen and got everybody in a froth over the idea that he just wants to play with the great Josh Allen uh, and win a championship uh, and money doesn't matter. Uh, money matters, especially after the Odell Beckham Jr. deal with the Baltimore Ravens that's going to pay him $15 million guaranteed and as much as $18 million this season. The Bills have less than $2 million in salary cap space right now. DeAndre Hopkins is about to turn 31. Uh, He served a six-game PED suspension last year. One more misstep, and he's gone for a year. Uh, He missed the last couple of games with a a knee soreness that people wonder if he just didn't want to play, which is whether whether he was hurt or whether he just didn't feel like playing. You know, either way, not great. Um. But um, go ahead about the uh, – the. you want to talk about the, the salary cap? Well, no, I, I just wanted to make uh, – kind of to augment the point you're making. But th- there's a lot – the Bills don't have very much cap room right now in 2023 to sign. You know, if a player wants $15 million, they only have two. But the way the NFL cap works, there's a lot of different massaging that can be done and reworking other contracts. The Bills can find the cap room to fit – DeAndre Hopkins onto this cap sheet and this roster if they really wanted to. But what that's going to do is only push things further into the future where the Buffalo Bills cap situation looks worse a year from now and into future seasons, but specifically a year from now, than it does now. And also, if you make a comparison to the Odell Beckham Jr. contract, Odell Beckham Jr. is on the books for $15 million, maybe $18 million if he hits some certain incentives. But if you look at the cap sheet, he's only counting $3 million three and a half million, I think, against the cap this year, but there's void years that are going to roll another 11 million onto the Ravens cap next year if they don't come up to a new deal. So with the Bills are have already kind of been into this all-in mode, but you can't keep doubling down and throwing more cards on top of the pile there. The Bills are about as all-in as they can already get, and going even more all-in is going to lead to a lot more roster purging and difficult decisions and inability to re-sign your own players next year and beyond. So bringing DeAndre Hopkins onto this team right now where it might be nice to add that name and that level of production, but I'm not so sure it's a huge need. You could be costing yourself Gabe Davis in the future. You could be preventing Trent Sherfield from making this roster and a lot of other moves that need to be made in the future and cap arrangements that the Bills are going to need to make in the future just become more and more difficult just by adding this player to this team right now that they probably don't need. And – you're right. And this isn't fantasy football. There is only one ball to be thrown around on a given play. And adding DeAndre Hopkins is not a factor of just him. Uh, it's mitigated by the fact that the Bills have other good players. It's not as though DeAndre Hopkins is going to be the centerpiece of the Bills offense. He is going to be the third most important playmaker on the team. And after Josh Allen, after Stefan Diggs and they just drafted a tight end that they hope is going to turn into something special. We don't know if that's going to be the case. Dawson Knox is going to get his catches. Naheem Hines and uh, James Cook are going to get their touches. Um, Gabriel Davis, uh, the Bills still have hope that he bounces back from a a difficult season. Uh, You mentioned Sherfield already, Deontay Hardy. Um, So adding Adding DeAndre Hopkins does not just give them a, you know, a, a massive, you know, uh, this isn't an exponential addition. Um, it's less, you know, it's almost like you're taking a less than Hopkins. Yeah. Or granted, he opens things up for other receivers. He opens things up for the offense. He maybe opens things up for the run game. The defense plays a certain way. Um, but we saw how frustrated Stefan Diggs got at the end of last season when he wasn't getting the ball as much as he wanted to. Uh, and he caught 108 passes. Uh, what's going to happen if Stefan Diggs 
yeah, the Bills are winning, but after four games, let's say they've won four straight, but he's only getting four tar four or five targets because um or or vice versa. Maybe DeAndre Hopkins is only getting four or five targets. How do you keep everybody happy? Uh and there's uh there are enough playmakers. And I, I should say uh, the there isn't yes, it can it be better? Of course. But there are enough playmakers already on this team, already getting paid, who already would be dead money if you had to move them around or get rid of them, uh, that make it very difficult just to slot somebody in and uh, expect a, a plug-and-play situation. So um, that is why the Bills have been, uh, according to my sources, intent on a very team-friendly deal uh, and – as it seems, uh, DeAndre Hopkins is not looking for team-friendly deals. He's looking for money that he needs, uh, especially after last season when he forfeited six game checks during his PED suspension. He's, uh, I keep reiterating, he's hes about to turn 31 here in a, next month, I think, or maybe even this month. Uh, and you, he's not going to get a chance to to – to get another big contract. I mean, those, those days are, are not, uh, those opportunities are not plentiful for him uh, at this stage of his career. He needs, and he's going to want to get paid. Now, if he finds that the market is just not there for him, maybe he waits until August. Maybe he waits for a team uh, that, that views itself as a contender and there's an injury. Hell, Maybe it's the Buffalo Bills and it's Stefan Diggs who gets hurt in training camp. But uh, it's going to take something like that. Um, a team for it. It's going to take something like that not happening and him to get totally disappointed in the market that's out there for him to come back to teams like the Bills and say, you know what, I'll, I'll play it on a one year prove it deal. Uh, yeah, let's see what happens. But that has not been. Uh, the message that has been sent from his camp uh, to anybody uh, who's been uh, talking to him. So the belief is that he's going to get paid and it's not going to be by Buffalo. Well, I think that the reporting you're doing, and, and hopefully we can see more of this, we have seen a little bit from the national reporters, but there's been inconsistent narratives. But I think flipping this to a situation where the general belief is that the bills are unlikely to sign DeAndre Hopkins. And if they happen to pull it together and sign them, that would be considered, you know, a surprise that comes out of nowhere, I think is a better and more realistic, logical way to view it as to where I think it's been flipped on its head to a way where there's a lot of Bills fans and media and observers that expect that the Bills are really in the mix or in the, the lead in this DeAndre Hopkins sweepstakes and will be surprised when he ends up signing somewhere else. And it, so I think it's good that, what you put out there and your sourcing and getting kind of people to kind of step away and look at it from a more realistic standpoint. However, I did want to ask your take on this because there is a belief, I think among the fan base, seeing that the chiefs are in the mix or seeing even some of the other names or that the Ravens already got Odell Beckham jr. But I think I've seen them floated as a team that could maybe kick the tires or the Cleveland Browns, or I haven't seen the jets, but if there's another team in the division, how much should the bills be looking to bring in, DeAndre Hopkins merely as a defensive maneuver to box out a team like the Chiefs or the Jets from getting him and having to play against him later in the season. I guess it's a consideration. Um, but I think that there's some hesitation. I mentioned in the story, these three different executives that I spoke with are all concerns about his practice habits, that he's a gamer, that he shows up and he plays, but there's uh, there's some wariness about investing in a player they're not all in on on a 31 year old who uh, you you put up with some of this stuff when he's 26 when he's 28 when he's 31 and you're plugging him into a team that you view as a contender that is you know it, there's a little bit of a risk involved there and if if it doesn't work out, uh, it, the the smaller the contract, the easier it is to move away, move on quickly. Uh, but if you commit, uh, and you might have to commit just to keep them away from another team, then you might be stuck with the guy that 
you know, is not able to stay on the field, is not able to play, give you uh, more than, you know, I'm just throwing a number out there. Let's say he only plays 12 games. Um, what he's not on, uh, he he's not on the practice field because he's banged up. Or what I mean, I'm, there's a lot of things that go into uh, an investment. There are a lot of reasons that I think the Bills or any team would say, okay, um, I can rationalize missing out on this player because it's not a perfect um, it's not a perfect asset. You know, there are there are ways that anybody can rationalize, okay, this some of the best deals are the ones that don't get made type thing. If he signs somewhere else, I don't think that there's going to be a ton of buyer's remorse. I think there's going to be probably be like, yeah, this might come back to bite us, but I don't think that anybody's going to be losing sleep over it. Yeah, I don't think so either. I mean, I, and I don't think this is how it's going to play out. I was just wondering that is the doomsday scenario with the AFC championship game and DeAndre Hopkins has eight catches and the Chiefs ride him and say he was the piece to put it right. over the top. And a lot of Bills fans are standing there like Stefan Diggs on the field, you know, wishing that that was them. Um, but I don't really think that's going to happen, but I suppose there is some potential that it could. I think the Bills did that. Their guy for this big move happened last year. That was Von Miller. Yes, absolutely. And I, I don't think that they can keep signing, doing Von Miller style deals at on various parts of the field. All right. Well, now we're, uh, we went and got our big edge rusher. Now let's go get our receiver. Okay. Now we need a big, uh, now we need a right tackle. Okay. Now next year, now we need a, a cornerback. I mean, you, there's only so many of these dice rolls that you can make when your quarterback is making so much money, when Stefan Diggs is making so much money, when you need to invest heavily in your offensive line to protect this quarterback asset. Um, there's only so much you can do. And I think that rolling the dice on uh, DeAndre Hopkins, because let us he's not a sure thing. As, as sexy as his stats are and his name recognition, um, he hasn't had a blockbuster season in, in, since 2020. Uh, he's had problems. He's had the knee injury. He's had the, the PED suspension. He's, um, people have questions. And this is not a slam dunk you put this guy on your team, you're going to win a championship because take a look at the success of the teams that he's been on. I mean, it's not like he hasn't been a game changer for Houston or Arizona. Um, granted, it's different when you're one of many and not maybe the, the superstar, but he's asking for number one receiver money. And Stefan Diggs is their number one receiver. And making number one receiver money and, as you mentioned with Von Miller, that was a big swing for the fences move and the jury's still out, whether that really has gotten the bills, what they hope to have get out of that, uh, you know, going all in on one established highly paid player. And the bills are in a position now with all these different contracts and up against the cap where they need the players like Taylor Rapp and Puna Ford and maybe Latavius Murray, the bargain signings. And if DeAndre Hopkins was willing to come to the bills on a minimum contract to chase a ring, and be part of this franchise, then I think that's a little bit of a different calculus. But as long as that's not the case, I just don't see how it adds up and makes sense for the Bills to really even consider it beyond face value. I mean, I, I know the Bills can't come out and just say, we don't want the player. But I kind of think at this point in time, after looking at the angles on it, that, that the Bills should be in that mindset, even if they're keeping that. There was a story back. today from the Houston Chronicle where uh, DeAndre Hopkins is interested in returning to the Texans. Um, I mean, the Texans are not a contender. I, I don't know, you know, who, who, what, I don't know what they got going on down there in Houston, but clearly he wants to go someplace where he can still be the man and make a lot of money. And I don't think that Houston is uh, going to jump to the, uh, front of the line when it comes to Super Bowl odds uh, if they were to get DeAndre Hopkins and they sure as shit aren't there without him uh, but if he really wants to win okay but if he's talking to the Houston Chronicle today and saying he would entertain returning to the Texans uh, then I think that shows you where his head is and what his in, what his intentions are he wants to get paid and uh, 
if he if he were to come out and say no i'm only talking to contenders all right well then maybe that changes everybody's thinking but the people who have done the due diligence who have actually kicked the tires the bills actually talked to deandre hopkins directly about a trade when he was still with the cardinals the cardinals gave him permission brandon bean talked to him um because he was representing himself. He didn't have an agent at the time. He just hired one a couple of days ago. But that shows you that the Bills have explored this. Teams have explored this. And he is, and I talked to three executives about it that are that is reported in my story. And here he is telling people, or telling at least the Houston Chronicle, or his camp is, that he's willing to return to Houston. So, I mean, I think it's pretty clear. Um, anything else, Joni, you want to get into? Oh, oh go ahead. That new agent is probably not going to guide DeAndre Hopkins into signing a veteran minimum contract to join the bills when there's, if there's other teams out there willing to pay more, that's just not how this business tends to work. But I think that that's where fans, where the messaging really got the fans excited when he is doing his social media stuff or his, um, and in interviews with different podcasts or the different there are videos out there people who've interviewed him and they ask him what quarterback you'd like to play with and he obviously is pumping Josh Allen's tires people then fall in love with the idea of DeAndre Hopkins turning down money because he loves Josh Allen so much that he is going to come and play for the Buffalo Bills and that's just not the reality of it I mean it, I think that he's going to need to get a lot of doors slammed in his face before he comes back uh, to a point where the where he would play for a at a price point the Bills are willing to pay. It's possible. That's where the long shot comes in. That's where the quote a long shot comes from from my source. Yeah, it's still possible, but they don't expect it to happen. Uh. John, anything else you want to get to before we um, wrap it up? Uh, no, that's about all I got. Who do you got winning the NBA championship? Well, um, gentlemen's wager uh, at Elmo's, uh, Mickey and I, uh, he, he allowed me to pick first. I could pick either the NBA or the NHL, and then he got to pick the other series. Uh Given my druthers, I picked the Nuggets to win uh, the final. He chose the Panthers for the uh, for the Stanley Cup, and so I have the West teams. He's got the East team. But the only one that I the one that I picked was Denver. I was stuck with Vegas. All right, well, I think Denver is going to win. But if you're looking for any local rooting interests. Eric Spolstra, his dad, spent a year as an executive with the Buffalo Braves way back when. And Bob McAdoo has, has been in that front office for many, many years. So there's a little bit of a Buffalo connection with the Miami Heat. And being an eighth seed, just like the Florida Panthers, I think there's some interest there in seeing these uh, not chalk picks competing for the championships here from the same city. Jonah, thanks for this. We'll huddle back up uh, next week. We'll have more to talk about, I'm sure. Maybe DeAndre Hopkins will have signed with the Bills by then. <laughs> Thanks to everybody out there for listening uh, and watching. Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara communities through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2022 to help keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you.
Thank you.